In the summer of 2022, Liz Truss was elected Prime Minister, and with her Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, they embarked on a bold economic experiment of large, unfunded tax cuts, primarily for the rich. They believed in a free market ideology and hoped a radical budget of tax cuts would stimulate economic growth in the UK and end its decade-long stagnation. However, even whilst the Chancellor was reading out his speech in Parliament, markets went into free fall, the pound fell and interest rates soared. Within 44 days, the experiment was over. But why did it fail so spectacularly? How much damage did it do? And what was the real reason that the budget was thwarted? The budget was unprecedented in its scale, £50 billion of unfunded tax cuts, which would see the UK deficit rise to £190 billion in just one year. It was enthusiastically welcomed by portions of the press. But the first problem with the budget was that it was very badly timed. In 2022, UK inflation was soaring to 10% by September. However, the impact of such a large scale of tax cuts would add more inflationary pressure to the economy. Tax cuts boost spending, pushing up inflation. It was actually the biggest tax cut since the Barber budget of 1972 in the so-called dash for growth, but that budget caused a boom, very high inflation, then recession. Now, in 2022, the Bank of England had already started to increase interest rates to 2% by September. But you could argue the bank were actually behind the curve. But market traders realised very quickly that this budget, on top of the existing 10% inflation, would mean that interest rates would have to go up very quickly. So traders sold government bonds and bond yields soared. Mortgage rates nearly tripled overnight. Many banks withdrew their mortgage products. For a decade, interest rates had been stuck at near zero, but now they were going up by the hour. The other problem was that UK debt had been rising since the great financial crisis. Net debt was now 95% of GDP, and the government finance is still recovering from the recent COVID bailout. On top of this, the mini-budget saw the projected budget deficit to soar, nearly doubling from 99 to 190 billion. And there was no plan to reduce the debt, just a vague hope that the tax cuts would encourage people to work more, higher growth, and the government would get more revenue. But the size of the deficit was another factor pushing up bond yields, as markets were concerned about the scale of borrowing with no strategy to reduce debt in the future. The credit rating agency Moody stated that the budget could permanently weaken the UK's debt affordability and they lowered their UK outlook to negative. Another complication is that the UK have many index-linked bonds. This means that the interest payment depends on inflation. So with inflation at 10%, it was suddenly much more expensive for the UK to borrow. UK debt interest payments soared to over £120 billion last year, and that was with most of the budget reversed. Just imagine the debt interest cost if the budget had per continued. Now, a good question to ask is who has the power to effectively reverse government policy? Well, there is a saying by one of Bill Clinton's political advisers. I used to think if there was reincarnation, I wanted to come back as a president. But now I would like to come back as a bond market. You can intimidate everybody. The thing about the bond market is that it is composed of self-interested investors who want to make money. These bond traders are exactly the kind of people who would benefit from these tax cuts. But in the bond market, there's no room for sentiment or political favours. They simply follow the money. It was obvious to everyone that the budget meant interest rates were going to have to rise. So everybody sold bonds and sold pounds. If you don't, you just lose money. And when people talk about some uh, left-wing deep state responsible for torpedoing the budget, I'm sure that many Goldman Sachs bankers will be laughing at the description of themselves. The market is essentially politically and morally neutral. As a government found out in the ERM crisis of 1992, you can't book the market when investors sent an opportunity to make money. And I guess there's a kind of irony that adherents of a free market were basically brought down by the operation of a free market. 
And there's another factor which is relevant. Markets did correctly judge that the budget was politically unsustainable. In the autumn of 2022, the UK was experiencing a severe cost of living. Real wages were falling due to higher energy prices. And the budget was notable in almost entirely been focused on high income earners. The budget left nearly half the population with inflation and higher cost of living still greater than any increase in income. But the richest 5% saw a very significant increase in income of £10,000. The IMF issued a rare rebuke saying that the budget would likely increase inequality. Paul Johnson of the IFS stated that the budget was a naked exercise in redistributing wealth upwards. And it was hard to find an economist who supported the government's approach. Did interest rates rise because of trust and Quateng? Well, during Truss's premiership, interest rates rose very quickly. They rose much faster than any comparable countries. Some market traders use the highly technical term, a moron premium. In other words, under Truss, UK interest rates were now higher than comparable countries because of economic policy. We were paying for the unfunded tax cuts with higher interest rates. Now, after Sunak replaced Truss and the budget was largely reversed, this interest rate premium declined. But it would be a mistake to say it had no lasting effect. The Resolution Foundation uh, state that the budget cost the country around £30 billion, £10 billion of higher interest payments and £20 billion through unfunded tax cuts. Also, the whole experience undermined the UK's international credibility. Larry Summers compared the UK to an emerging market turning into a submerging market. It severely dented business confidence at a time when investment levels were already low. It also impacted household confidence, who were shocked at the scale of interest rate rises. After a decade of easy government borrowing, the market reaction made politicians much more wary about increasing government borrowing. Now, in 2023, interest rates continued to climb because inflation proved more stubborn than expected. The UK had an inflation rate a, a bit higher than other European countries, but that was not really due to the uh, trust budget, but more issues around productivity, Brexit, falling pound. What about the role of the Bank of England? Well, you could argue the Bank of England made a mistake in pursuing nearly £400 billion of quantitative easing during Covid and then keeping interest rates too low for too long. When trust came to power, they were already behind the curve and needed to increase interest rates anyway. But that doesn't alter the genuine impact that trust and Quateng had on short-term bond yields, which definitely increased very rapidly. Also, it's important to bear in mind that the market reaction could actually have been a lot worse without Bank of England intervention. Bond yields rose so fast in October and September that pension funds were at risk of running out of liquidity and were close to being wound up. The Bank of England had to halt their quantitative tightening policy and buy £65 billion of bonds to stabilise the bond market. What about the underlying logic of tax cuts? The budget was incredibly badly timed. Truss and Quateng showed a, a lack of flexibility. After the initial bad market reaction, Quateng doubled down, saying he didn't care if a pound fell, it would bounce back, and they would push through even more tax cuts soon. If they had gone more slowly, more judiciously, they could have at least introduced some of the tax cuts. But would that have helped the UK economy? The logic is that high marginal tax rates reduce incentives to work, cut taxes, increase productivity, increase growth, and tax revenues rise. It's kind of a standard Laffer curve analysis. And you could argue that if you go back to 1979, when marginal tax rates and high earners was 83%, there really is a disincentive effect. But when you come to 2022, 45% is not that significant. There may have been a marginal increase in productivity, but there was no magic bullet to solving the UK's decade-long stagnation. Focusing on tax cuts and corporation tax cuts is only a very one small potential area of the UK's problems. The problems go much deeper than that. Low productivity growth, disruptions to trade, planning restrictions, lack of skilled labour, underfunded public services. There's a whole range of issues that that budget didn't address. And if there is a real problem of disincentives in the labour market, it tends to come down actually at lower income levels. 
where people who take full-time work lose uh, benefits. For example, with a very high effective marginal tax rate for those who have two or three children, because the freezing of child benefit has caused marginal tax rates of up to 87% for families with three children. Truss and Quateng had the right idea that the UK economy needed to promote economic growth, but by focusing on tax cuts for high earners, they did little to change the underlying issues. But the main problem with the budget was it was very badly timed, with no awareness of a macroeconomic situation. The truth is that if they had announced a budget in the mid-2010s when interest rates and inflation were low, the market would have accepted it. But the first rule of a Chancellor is to understand what is happening to the economy at that point in time. Also, another interesting question is why has it proved so hard to reduce UK debt despite so many years of relative austerity? This video looks at the unfortunate cycle of rising debt and low growth, which has done so much to damage the economy. But also, are there any policies which could help the UK break out of this low growth cycle?